Hello, welcome to the Joystick Frequency. It's a video game podcast that doubles as a video game book club where you're a member just by listening in and playing along. I'm your host, Trent. Joining me are my co-host, Walker. Um, that, that's a little weird. Uh, maybe he's having some issues. Brady? Oh, weird. No one showed up. Yeah, that's right, guys. It's a solo bolo podcast today. Won't be doing these very often, but... Uh, Turns out Starfield and Baldur's Gate 3 are pretty huge, and none of us have been able to complete either or both of them yet. So, due to the fact that it's been about a month and a half since we put out a podcast, we figured we should put something out. And unfortunately, Walker has family in town, and Brady hasn't played anything besides Baldur's Gate 3. So, that just leaves me to pick up the slack for this time. So, don't worry. They'll join in the next time. But, for now... Enjoy, as it'll be the Trent journey today. Uh, And we're going to talk about two indie games that I played that'll probably end up being on my top ten list. We'll see. I rather enjoyed both of these games. The first one's going to be The Bookwalker, Thief of Tales. And then the second one is Bramble, The Mountain King. So, without further ado, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, let's just go ahead and get on talking about it. But first, uh, I should probably go into what I've been playing this month. So, other than the Bookwalker, Thief of Tales, Bramble the Mountain King, been playing the little Exo Primal with some friends, got back into Apex Legends, enjoying that again. Recently downloaded Overwatch and have been playing that with uh, my editor, actually, and been having a lot of fun with that again for the first time in years. Uh, obviously, a lot of Baldur's Gate 3, I have two different playthroughs going. One is with a group of friends that I don't play very many things with, so that's good. And then the other is actually a group of me, Brady, our college, my college friend Nathan, and our editor, uh, Casa, playing a playthrough on that. As well as I'll probably end up starting a third playthrough going through the Dark Urge side of the story at some point. But Baldur's Gate 3 will definitely be the next podcast, so I'm not going to dive into that much anymore. Other than that, I've downloaded some other games recently that came out this year, so I can try and at least have a bunch of games under my belt for the top 10 coming up soon this year. have not started Starfield yet. It is way too big to fit on my Xbox currently, so I'm trying to get some things done to make room for that. But I fully intend on playing a good chunk of that before December. Um, got some things coming up uh, soon. Had a, had a wedding this past weekend, and... And I'll have a Renaissance Festival coming up next month. But other than that, I'll be having a lot more time for games due to the fact that um, my current arc of the D&D campaign is ending. So be ready for me to talk about a whole lot more games coming up soon. But anyway, without further ado, let's just go ahead and get started on The Bookwalker, Thief of Tales. So The Bookwalker was developed by Do My Best which I've never heard of them, but it was published by Tiny Build. And I, I like Tiny Build. Tiny Build has put out a bunch of games that I really enjoyed. So uh, the Steam description for this game, I'll go ahead and read it off. Maybe it'll interest you, and if you haven't played it yet, it'll maybe it'll make you want to go play it after this. So, The Bookwalker is a narrative adventure in which you play as Etnine Quest, a writer-turned-thief with the ability to dive into books, Use your powers to journey between reality and book worlds and steal legendary items like Thor's hammer and Excalibur to restore your ability to write. So, first off, they told about the ability to go into books. That's a very core concept of this as every there's an outside world and then an inside the book world. You're doing these different jobs going into these books to steal certain items. And each book is its own separate environment, its own separate environmental style, as well as having its own set of characters and stuff. Some of the books may have similar like characters, like there's a few mentions of Sherlock Holmes, uh, as well as some other famous titles uh, throughout the game. But I, from the most part, unless I just am completely wrong, I haven't heard of any of the books that you actually dive into in this game being real books. But if they were, I would probably read every single one of them. I enjoyed most of the worlds in this game. So the basic concept is you're you're playing as Etnine Quist and he is recently he is a writer that has recently been tried and cannot write for 30 years in this government that's writers seem to have some sort of 
different set of powers than other people, and it can cause some disruption in the world. Uh, so all we know is that he is a writer that has recently been punished with having his ability to write taken away by these magical handcuffs that cannot be uh, removed, and they make it to where he cannot write. And supposedly he has them for 30 years, which is a punishment far worse than most of the characters in the game have ever heard of. So you know he did something bad, and you find out later on what it is. But in an attempt to get these cuffs off so that he can write again, because all he wants to do is write, he does some illegal contracts for this character called the uh, or that I've just dubbed the Unknown Caller, that you'll eventually find out who he is later on in the game. But he calls and gives you these contracts to dive into these books to steal certain items for certain people. And, like, bec he's getting paid, like, a lot of money, so he ends up funding his life in this small apartment through these contracts that he's doing and these items that he's stealing. And as he gets further along, he eventually uncovers the truth of the Unknown Caller as well as more. you find out more about himself through playing as him, as well as he has this little... Supposedly it's a character that has been written out of a book, though that it is not named... Uh, he is simply called Roderick, and he is just a simple scrap of paper that's in a metal container that speaks to Etnim through his quest and also provides help throughout. Uh, you can ask him for advice and hints and stuff like that. As far as the gameplay goes, it's typically an isometric top-down view of whatever world you're in. You go, you know, like, it'll render render a room, and you'll go through a door or something, and it'll render the next room and stuff like that. But everywhere you go, you can interact with the environment in some ways. And a lot of the times, that's how you get through the level. That's how you pass it. Another way is through dialogue with characters that you find. They'll give you certain tasks and you have to go do certain things with it. Uh, with the things that they give you, with the access that they give you to certain th places. And the more you play, the more items you find. And you can use these items to craft tools that make things easier. Like, for instance... You can come to a box. Well, you can either smash open, try to smash open the box. Uh, there's an option to use ink, which is not your health bar, but it's a it's a resource that you use for combat that we'll get into later. But you can use ink to bypass certain things in the environment instead of having to go find the tools. But if you do craft the tool, it makes it to where you can get into whatever this box is and find either more items, maybe a certain quest item that you need, or even just some healing items just to make things easier as you go throughout the level. And as you go through, you find out that Etnine doesn't really care for underwritten characters or just characters that don't have a lot of depth to them. And the little scrap of paper character, Roderick, that's speaking to him, is sitting there constantly, you're constantly probing Etnin's mind to try and figure out why he feels this way. And it's a really good twist at the end whenever you, whenever you finally figure out why he did this and you're like slowly piecing together the pieces of what what is legal and what is illegal in this world. And Roderick is actually a character that was taken out of his book, which is not allowed. That is absolutely not allowed. But he also doesn't have a form, like a humanoid physical form, like most characters, if you wrote them out of a book, would have. So he's just this little scrap of paper. But he, that little scrap of paper has so much personality, and you almost side with him in almost every argument, honestly, as you're playing this. Though you are playing, playing Etnine, you find yourself siding with Roderick a lot more. Um... Now, I do say, Roderick only speaks and is only able to speak whenever he is inside a book. Anytime you are in the overworld in Etnine's apartment, it is just Etnine there. Um, Roderick cannot speak. Etnine has a couple neighbors that you'll go and interact with uh, through the game. You can explore the, the... So the apartment is like its own apartment, but if you go outside, there's uh, you're on a second floor landing, essentially, with two other apartments and a kitchen in it. And you can go downstairs, and there's an, uh, a, a cut-off apartment as well as a storage room 
that's about as far as the overworld extends. Um, and as you go through the uh, the worlds in the book, sometimes you find an item that you can't craft, or uh, no, not an item, you need an item that you can't craft. And Roderick will suggest, well, can you find one of those in the real world? And you'll have to go back to the real world and go ask one of your neighbors to borrow said item. Uh, and then it, it makes, you'll have that item for the duration of the book, I think. And then uh, it makes finding certain secrets in it very e a lot easier. Um, so each of the books you're trying to find a certain item, and whenever it comes to towards the end of that book or towards the end of your your, because you're set in a certain time in that book, so all the events that you would have read would have already passed by then. So it's more of just like the in the moment thing. So for instance, in the first book, you're going after this potion of immortality. Uh, you find yourself in a facility that this alchemist is trapped in, but uh, this alchemist was like some sort of undercover uh, organization has pretty much trapped this alchemist here and demanded that he make an immortality potion. And so he has not only done that, but he also has been developing a way to get out of said facility. And you come into the book at the moment that he is beginning his escape, essentially. But you're several rooms behind him, and you have to play catch-up the entire time. You eventually do catch up to him. And one of the things I like is it. the game gives you a... Like a an idea that your choices matter in the fact that at the end of the first one, you choose whether or not you can let the alchemist keep half of the immortality potion in order to maybe be able to resurrect his dead wife, or you just take the whole thing and then the alchemist dies right there. Uh, but you complete the, you complete the mission by having the whole potion that you needed. Um, and most of the outcomes of this is mostly just whether or not you're getting yelled at by your your mystery employer, essentially, or not. So a lot of the tra traversing through this level is, or at least for the first level, is mostly environmental interaction and finding notes and letters here and there to figure out where they are. And some of them you'll have to actually talk to people. There's a Hogwarts-esque world where there are several witches and wizards in a world of magic that is slowly getting outdated by technology, which is I find very interesting. One of my favorite levels of the game. But you'll find yourself finding clues and items a lot more frequently through the use of dialogue in that one. Uh, dialogue choices don't really matter. It's more about how... The dialogue only helps you gain information, essentially. Not most dialogue in the game does not have a consequence on which, on any choices uh, like that. There, uh, except for like maybe a few like specifically story related NPCs. I've already talked about the use of ink, how it can make thing getting through things easier. Uh, ink also has another use in combat. So in combat, you have an ink meter. You, have, you can have up to 100 ink. And each of the abilities that you have requires a different amount of ink. Now, your health is set to 5, and it's all, uh, like you can only have 5 health at, uh, at, the start of, uh, at the start of any level. And that is how much health you have throughout the entire things, unless you find healing items. Uh, you can find the items that you use in combat are essentially healing items or ink vials to replenish your ink. Seem to be some of the only items, at least until later, very later on in the game, where you get to actually use some pretty cool items. Um, so combat's very simple. It is a turn-based combat style and... It actually shows you what the next action that the enemies will take that you're fighting. Uh, you'll either fight an enemy one on one, or you can fight up to I think the highest I fought is five enemies at a time. 
and you have a different set of abilities to basically take care of it. So for one, you have uh, just your standard attack, which I think is your slash. It costs 30 ink, and it does just two to three damage, I believe, to a single target. You will find upgrades as you complete books to further increase your abilities later on, but uh, I'm not going to spoil any of the upgrades on what they do. Then you have Drain. Drain does one damage, I think. Is it one or two? It's either one or two damage, but it uh, gives you 30 ink back so that you can use your better attack. So it's probably one damage, if I had to think of it. Then you have Stun. Stun hits all enemies for one damage and stuns them for one turn, but it costs 30 ink. And then the last one you have is Shield. Shield gives you two temporary hit points to basically just block attacks for you. Uh, costs no ink, but you don't get to do anything else that turn. So, And I found getting through some of the combat encounters with the limited resources that you have, they try not to throw a lot of health items, and you definitely don't get a lot of spare ink to use through out the level. So you have to find a good balance of attacking, draining, and shielding to make sure you can do certain things uh, throughout the fight. When it comes to the level variety in this game, it's fairly well spread out, honestly. The first book you go into is a dungeon slash laboratory like level. You'll, like I said, you have the Hogwarts like wizard school level that's pretty interesting. You go into a sci fi futuristic uh, world where you're one of the very last living things and you're talking to an AI most of the most of the level there there's one of the most interesting things is you actually go into a book that was written by Etnine and that entire level was just lore dump after lore dump after lore dump and it was such a good way to finally like reveal the curtain and figure out what's going on with Etnine as well as you have a there's another level that's a, I don't want to say post-apocalyptic, but it felt kind of post-apocalyptic factory setting. And, like, their level diversity is really good. They, they, they figured out a good stick for each level, stuck with it, and everything felt like it fit. And, I don't know, the, the game, I feel, is just really good in the fact that the thing I've wanted most ever since I was a kid reading books is to just dive into the world of the books I've been reading. I didn't get to experience that for the first time. Or, well, I, I did get to experience it for several times, but I, the best example being Hogwarts Legacy that came out earlier this year, how I actually felt like I was jumping into the books of Harry Potter. It was great. This game actually lets you do that, though they're not books that I've read or books that I don't even know if exist. But it was a really really strange and enjoyable feeling being able to just dive into books and dive in and out and do whatever I wanted uh, in them, essentially. Now, since I'm trying not to spoil much because I don't know if either of the other two guys are going to play these games, but I would like to not spoil just in case they do decide to because these will probably end up being on my top ten list this year. But, uh... So I don't want to discuss spoilers, endings, and stuff like that. But instead, since it's a Trent solo session, we will go into the most important thing that I play games for. Or, well, one of the most important things. Uh, achievements. So, for the Bookwalker achievements, they're, they're pretty basic ones. You get one for completing every chapter. You get a couple for using your abilities a certain amount of times. However... I found that there were actually some bugged achievements. There are some that uh, have been bugged since day one that have not been fixed yet, which I find a little disappointing. I uh, Hang on, let me see. What day did this... The game came out in June, at the end of June, so they've had four months. or So I played it about a month ago, so they've had three months since then, but have not fixed those issues yet, so I'm hoping that maybe they will at some point, and maybe I'll go back and beat them. Uh, 
some of the other achievements require multiple playthroughs, as in those choices that I said. You get about one of those choices at the end of every book that you go into. So it requires at least two, maybe three playthroughs, unless you use Save Abuse to go through and get those achievements. And uh, I played through it twice. I got most of the achievements except for the bug ones. There's also uh, one of the achievements I really liked is uh, going through and beating every combat, like doing every combat encounter possible throughout it, and like it just prove you're an asshole kind of thing. I I, I love genocide runs, so that was not uh that was a fun achievement to go get. Uh, uh, like as far as the bug achievements, I mean that's a disappointment. Obviously, I I would hope that you'd be able to have those fixed, but what can you do? I did not get all the achievements, obviously, because they're bugged. Uh, I don't think there was, like, an overly difficult one in this. I th- I think the only one is there were a couple where you had to play a combat perfectly and not get hit in it. I think there were one or two of those, which was annoying because you had to, like, you had to figure out a strategy, and a lot of the times it was just sitting there and shielding over and over again until they had the correct actions that you wanted them to do. As far as that, thoughts and ratings, so... Like I said, it was very interesting concept of having this world where you're a, a rider with powers, but they've taken away your riding ability because of something you did. And following the story along was a very enjoyable. I did enjoy it. Uh, diving into the books and each one having a different environment was a really cool concept that I really enjoy. And I hope they that another game like this can come out and maybe you can do that. Some of the uh, environments were better than others, in my opinion. Uh, I I know I found myself slogging through one of the middle levels just because I didn't enjoy it as much. And uh, honestly, I started playing the game for about a week, stopped for about two weeks, and then came back to it because I was just going through that slog of that level. But the story was good. The, the couple twists that you have... At the end, we're good, and the final hour of gameplay was really fun and very enjoyable. It made you feel like you were really overpowered, kind of, uh, which I always like having at least like one section like that uh, in a game. Um, if I had to give it a rating, it was a little buggy at times. Uh, the controls are slightly janky uh, sometimes as... You'll be moving and then you'll try and like to interact with something, but you can't get the right angle on the control stick to actually get it to move. Uh, I imagine it's a lot easier on PC where you can just point and click everything that you want to go interact with. With the bugged achievements, story was good. It wasn't anything crazy fantastic. I would probably give this game a 7.5 out of 10 if I had to. I really enjoyed it and the... The combat of the game, I felt, I felt was like just a little lacking in what you could do. But other than that, yeah, I feel like this game was a 7.5 out of 10. All right, so uh, now that we've discussed the book, Walker, it's time for our mid-podcast break where Walker is going to be doing trivia. Oh, wait. Well, I guess we're moving on, guys, to Bramble the Mountain King. So Dim Frost Studio developed... Bramble the Mountain King and Merge Games was the publisher. So let me go pull up the Steam uh, description of Bramble the Mountain King. Bramble the Mountain King is a grim adventure set in a world inspired by dark Nordic fables. Explore the beautiful yet dangerous and twisted land of Bramble in your endeavor to rescue your sister. Traverse a wondrous landscape and survive deadly encounters with Bramble's many hide- uh, hideous creatures. So yes, Bramble is a survivor horror game and... Honestly, if as soon as you get done listening to this podcast, I, I would recommend playing that game this month for October if you're into spooky shit. It, it was a really fun game. I really enjoyed uh, going through it. Uh, there, there Obviously, it has a couple of slug, sluggish levels, but the story was uh, pretty good. The, uh, the, the characters are a little eh, meh. It, it was... There's not much dialogue in this game. It's more told almost like a storybook. 
honestly. You have your narrator that probably does most of the speaking throughout it with very few lines of dialogue coming from any of the characters, honestly. Yeah, the, I, I can only remember specifically one, like one character that actually talks. The others are all, uh, like everything else is all just narration. Uh, oh, never mind. Uh, the, the sister talks. I remember that. Okay. But yeah, very little dialogue, mostly narration, almost like like a fantasy of, of fairy tale storybook kind of thing. Or, well, not fairy tale because it's quite horrifying. So, um, you get into... Uh, so, you start this game by waking up in your room, noticing that your sister is not there. Uh, you spend a couple minutes interacting with the room before you finally figure, uh, before it finally tells you to go out the window. You go out the window and start going through the woods in your backyard till you finally find sight of your sister. You chase her up to the top of uh, a small mountain in your backyard, essentially. And then once you get up there, your sister ends up getting kidnapped after a while and you basically have to go find her and save her again. You get this this light orb that's pretty much the only the only item like you need and you get in the game that you can use. And uh, basically, you it's this just this glowing. I don't want to say holy, but like it's 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 a light that wards off evil. So uh, you can throw it at people. You interact with it uh, at places to have certain things happen, as well as you just use it to light your path. So, uh, the characters you're playing as a little boy named Ollie. I want to say he's somewhere around eight years old, and the sister you're going after is probably like around twelve. Her name's Lilia Moore. Uh, other than that, you don't run into a lot of named characters. There's mostly just creatures and monsters that you run into. Uh, there are a couple standouts. Um, there's Lemus, the stone giant, who is this. I want to say, like, th there are trolls in the game, so I can't call him a troll, but he's, like, this not... this. He's got, like, a trollish face, or, like, like, like kind of like an ogre face or something, but uh, he's made out of stone. Apparently, people make fun of him, but uh, he helps you out in a couple of locations where uh, you just stand on his hand and he, like, will lift you up to some place. He shows up a few times. You have Tuva, who is one of the main story driving uh, characters in the game you interact uh, you encounter him twice uh, in the back of, uh, actually I would say in, in like the middle portions of the game where you're in this library and you finally get more story on the Mountain King which is the next character I'll go into in just a second but like he has this library and he's like this big warm humanoid looking He's probably like a like a goblin. It, it's hard to say. I I'm not very well acquainted with Nordic folklore and stuff like that, but I did find myself like really enjoying uh, this game and the the creatures within it. Um, so you also have the Mountain King, who is basically this king who his wife died and only had what was left was a son. Well, eventually his son ends up uh, dying uh, dying because of him trying to find a cure for his sickness and ha and basically cause the forest to become overgrown with this bramble. It's Bramble the Mountain King. Uh, this, this bramble almost has a mind of its own and it's, it tries to fight you at several points throughout the game as well. And then the only other character I would mention uh, in the, like, the brief list is um, Pesta. He's this weird guy that's in uh, like he he's pretty much only there for for a boss fight, but uh, you get a couple of hints at him. Uh, he's uh, basically a boatman, and I think he's supposed to like kind of be almost acquainted with uh, Charon of Greek mythology, kind of as in he uh, if you're ever caught on the boatman's boat, essentially he is taking you to your death or he is taking you to your afterlife, essentially, and. Uh, like, he's this real creepy guy that you're sitting there rowing a boat, and he, like, will appear behind you all of a sudden. And all he does is, like, cover your eyes for the boss fight, and then you're 
uh, like warped into a another world where he like controls what he does. He is like giant, has his face appearing everywhere and doing all this weird stuff. It's really cool. I'll I'll talk about more about that whenever I talk about that and one other boss fight later on. But so you have uh you have these characters that don't show up for very often, but uh, even a couple of them are like really cute. You, you find some gnomes that are super cute and will help guide you along your way as well as you solve puzzles with them a little bit. Uh, you have the frog prince. Is it the frog prince or frog king? The frog prince. The frog prince will uh, uh, save you at one point, like right when your sister gets kidnapped, as well as you have the, the trolls that actually are the ones that kidnapped your sister for the mountain king. So... Uh, gameplay wise, so like I said, it's a um, it's a survival horror game, or not survival adventure horror game. You're playing uh, it's 3D and you're playing from a third person perspective. However, that does change fairly often. Like they are constantly changing the how the camera looks in this game to provide the best like surprise, the best aha moment, the best uh, jump scare moment. And best, like, just overall atmosphere of this game. If you're looking for something that doesn't have very many jump scares, but keeps you on edge the entire time just with the atmosphere it builds, this is a really good game for that. Um, this game is all about platforming. There's hardly any combat, and any combat you do, it's not really combat. It's more just throwing that light at things to have it interact with things, uh, interact in a certain way, and then you have to go and pick it up at some point. So most of it is platforming and solving these puzzles to open up paths for you to get further. Uh, there are also stealth sequences. These stealth sequences are basically uh, you're just crouching and traveling as uh, almost... If you've ever played the Batman Arkham games, you know how the Scarecrow levels in the, in the first game in Arkham Asylum. You're sitting there going between cover and cover while the Scarecrow is looking... Uh, looking for you with like a searchlight. It's very, it is almost picture perfect, exactly that. Only there are also traps placed in the environment. Uh, for instance, there is this section where you're trying to avoid the troll's gaze and you're going through water from cover to cover. But in the water, as the light that the troll is shining goes over the water, you see in the water on the, of the ground of it is these bear traps and this game insta kills you anytime you do anything wrong. Fall in a pit, dead. Uh, fall too far, dead. Step in a bear trap, dead. Uh, get caught by a troll, tr- dead. Just it's it's insta death anytime as a consequence, and you'll go back to the uh, the next checkpoint. Um, so you're going through this stealth sequence, and you have to watch where the troll's gaze goes over the tr- uh, the next section. So that you know where the traps are and try and maneuver around them without having vision on them anymore while the troll's not looking there and get to the next bit of cover so that you're safe. Uh, As well as you have these certain boss fights where you have to do certain things in them. So the previous character I mentioned, Pesta, he has one of the more interesting boss fights where you get in this boat and you're sitting here rowing across across a small channel to get to the, the, uh, the other side. And every, like, you, you can only row a certain distance. Like, like it's actually having you row and try and maneuver it uh, as accurate as you can. So that anytime he covers your eyes, you get warped in this place. So basically, it's an endurance fight. It's a war of attrition. You go over and over again, uh, trying to get as far as you can in this boat uh, before he covers your eyes, but every time he covers your eyes, you're warped into this dark, war- uh, dark realm, uh, dark dimension kind of thing, where Pesta does numerous different attacks. Uh, there's the first, uh, the first one where uh, he duplicates all of his heads, and you have to find the one that's growing rat whiskers. Uh, which, if you pay attention to the lore earlier in the game, you'll understand why he has the wa- rat whiskers and like the. The hair growing on his face for that one. You have to find which face is gr- um, growing that hair, and it's like very distinct. Like whenever they appear, it's it doesn't have the hair, and it just slowly like starts appearing. So you have to be quick on the draw, essentially. And you find which one it is. You throw the light at it, and uh, that uh, you survive that attack. Then there's another attack where a face appears 
under you on the ground and he tries to swallow you essentially uh, or bite you uh, and you have to just avoid the mouth, jump off uh, so you're not hit. Then there's another one where he takes his rake and because he's giant, it's it's giant and it, like bigger than you and he swipes it across the ground a couple times and you have to go through the the gaps in, in between the spokes of the rake. I can't remember if he has any other attacks other than that. Those are just the, the ones I specifically remember. But you have to survive, basically, I think... Oh, every time every time you dodge an attack, he appears, and you get to, like, hit him with the light. If you hit him, that's that, that's damage, in quotes. Uh, if you miss him, you'll have to find... Uh, you'll have to wait till your next chance to. And every time you hit... Uh, every three times you hit him, it takes you back to the boat to where you're rowing again until he covers your eyes and takes you in again. And the... The attacks get harder and harder to avoid slash dodge slash discover who the real one is every time. So uh, it's really a war of attrition. The longer it goes on, the harder it's going to be uh, until you finally get across the the channel and you beat the boss fight. Another one I found very interesting was Skogsra. Now, I'm just going to call her Skog to make it easier because that name's hard to pronounce. But while you're fighting her, she is basically, she's this long, uh, or not, not long, sorry. She's this, so everyone's bigger than you are, essentially, because it's folklore. So she is like maybe this nine foot tall woman. She's still thin and uh, very beautiful. She's got uh, long black hair. Uh, by the way, don't play this in front of your kids because she's also naked uh, while you're fighting her. I don't, I didn't pay too much attention to it, so I don't think it shows anything below uh, below the chest, but either way, uh, she has these big antlers also growing out of her uh, head, uh, but she also has like a hollowed out section in her back that seems to be where her heart is, essentially, and you have to stab her in the heart in order to, in order to beat her. So her boss fight, the way that it works is... You're gonna spawn into this, uh, like this grove, essentially, with a ring of trees that you're running through, and she creates these like blood spikes that uh, spawn at the base of these trees, which uh, you're trying to hide behind the trees to dodge her blood wave attack. So it's a lot of like you make sure you know which attack she's doing before, uh, so that you can try and avoid it correctly. Um, so she makes these spikes around the base of trees. She conjures blood clots uh, that burst and kill those nearby as well as she, um, she'll she also take uh, just, I guess it's just blood, uh, just like coagulated blood and throw it at you to hit you. And like I said, one hit and you're dead. So you have to be sure to dodge all these appropriately. And then she takes a blood wave shock wave that comes out from her and the only way to dodge that is by standing behind a tree. So as you're sitting here going around in this circular tree arena, you have to find these corpses, basically, that she has near her. And you have to hit all the corpses. And the corpses, they, um, they're they like linked to her or something. Or, they're, or maybe they create some sort of damaging ability that goes and hits her and knocks her on the ground, essentially. Whenever it knocks her on the ground, that's whenever you have to go up to her back and hit her in the heart. You have to do this a, a couple phases with everything getting harder. But as soon as you finally run up and stab her in the heart uh, for the last time, you've completed the boss fight. But uh, it was one of the harder boss fights because going around and getting all the corpses without getting hit was very hard. Because whenever you aim with the light ball, you like zoom in very heavy. So it's hard to like keep her in frame while also keeping the corpse in frame. And so that you can appropriately see what attack she's throwing at you. And there's a checkpoint after every phase. But if you get hit after taking a couple of corpses out, those corpses reset. And you have to hit them again on your next try. As well as the ones you didn't hit to still get her to the point to where you can finally do damage to her. So the last thing I want to talk about is some of the puzzles in the game. Some of the puzzles will have this door that you have to get through, but uh, in order to get through the door, you have to stop this fire that's like emerging from the ground 
and like kind of like it's not going very high up, but it's going like partly up the door. It's almost like a um like how you would depict like a summoning circle or something like that. How there's like a just a small bit of energy coming from that. It's basically that where it's just the threshold of the door, but it'll have a symbol on the door, and you have like certain alchemical ingredients around and a cauldron and the alchemical ingredients will have a certain part of the symbol on the door and you have to make sure that you get all the parts that make up that symbol so for instance let's say the door has a square and at the top of that square it has a triangle but also inside the square touching the edges is a circle you have to go find the ingredients to have all of those shapes individually. It's it's not going to have the whole symbol on it. You have to find the ones that make up the whole symbol and throw it in the cauldron, mix it up, and then pour it at the door, and that will open the door, essentially. Uh, I thought it was a very unique way to do a puzzle. In fact, it gave me a couple of ideas for like instances I could do that in D&D, uh, for instance. This game is a very good conduit for some of the stuff I plan on doing in D&D at some point now. But then again, that's just folklore in general, so what do you expect? All right, so uh, like I did with the Bookwalker, it's time to talk about the achievements for this game. You get your standard achievements for doing story-related stuff uh, and defeating bosses. There's also uh, collectible achievements, or achievements for getting collectibles, each one individually, in fact. And the collectibles in this game are like little wood carved statues like they were carved by the little boy that you're playing as of several of the characters. I know there's one... I don't think there's one of him. There's one of his sister. There's one of Tuba, the Mountain King, uh, Lemus, the Stone Giant. All the bosses you face, pretty much. uh, As well as just most of the characters you interact with. I don't think there's one for the Frog Prince. It's probably the only character you run into that there's not one for. But you get an achievement for every uh, one of those collectibles... You get, so other than the story-related ones and the collectibles one, the only other achievements that I remember are there's one for at the end of the Skog, uh, Skogstra fight. Whenever you're stabbing her in the heart, the, the light actually develop, uh, like forms into a little dagger that you're sta- stabbing her with, essentially. I only mentioned this because it was funny and it took me for uh, like forever to get but there's an achievement for stabbing her a hundred times in that. And it's a quick time event to stab her. So you have to be sure to press the button at the correct time to do it. But you have to stab her a hundred times, basically. And you're like, your kid's pissed at this point. Your character, Ollie, is like, he's an eight-year-old boy, but he's pissed at this point. And so he's just going hog wild, stabbing at this lady over and over again, getting drenched in blood. Completely. Like, his entire face is covered by the end of this. Uh, But finally, you stab her for the hundredth time, and it's like, uh, I think the achievement's like something along the lines of, like, did you finally get that out of your system, or something like that? Or maybe it's just called murder. Or maybe the murderer is the one for killing Skog. Either way, it's, it's just a really funny and horrific achievement to have for this game. Uh... And then the last one is the only achievement I didn't get for the game because I don't like games that do this, like uh, Limbo did it. Um, It's for having a deathless run. This game, I died definitely over 100 times throughout the entire time of me playing it. And this game is probably only like a 5-6 hour game, honestly. Uh, By the way, the Bookwalker is probably an 8-10 to hour game. But this game is like a five to six hour game, and I died over a hundred times. And I do not like the achievements that it's just like go through the entire game without dying. Because it just involves a whole lot of like cloud saving, and like it, it auto saves as soon as you die. So you have to, like, if you know you're gonna die, you have to fucking quit out of the game as quick as possible to try and avoid that. Or you have to constantly like back up cloud saves and stuff like that. And it's just, it's not a fun achievement. Yeah, yeah, you'll feel great for getting it if you do get it but eh. there's not an achievement for speed running it but this game i feel is actually a really good speed run game uh which for the people that can do the, the deathless runs it works out for so it's really cool as far as that that's all about the achievements the a lot of the achievements don't stray from the 
collectibles were the story related ones, so pretty uh, bread and butter achievement wise. So, so finally, just my last thoughts and my rating. So, I really like Scandinavian slash like Nordic folklore as an aesthetic. I haven't delved into it very much at all. Aside from the little stuff I know about, uh, for instance, like Thor, Loki, and like just the the pantheon of gods, essentially, I don't know. I don't know a lot of the lesser stories or the the creatures involved in said folklore. So getting to go into this and learn a little bit about it made me want to go read about some of it, which I, I still want to go do at some point. I just need to find the time to. I don't play very many horror games because. Horror games are games I feel like is a lot better to experience with a uh, with a friend or with people watching or playing alongside with you. For instance, the Until Dawn game. I played that uh, by myself one playthrough and with people uh, on another playthrough. And I found that I thoroughly enjoyed the multiple person playthrough a lot more than I did the first playthrough. So I try to avoid horror games as much as possible. Or not avoid them as much as possible, just avoid playing them unless I know I can have other people to watch or play along at least. Like passing off the controller kind of stuff. So in order for me to like play this and actually get through it is a testament of itself. It's a really, really fun short game. I enjoyed a lot of it. I, I'm like I'm trying to think of some instance that I didn't like, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, so I don't think I found any part that I disliked then, if that's the case. Uh, the boss fights were a lot of fun. Some of them were engaging. Some of them you had to learn and figure out what exactly you had to do to avoid all attacks. Because, like I said, one hit and you're dead. So, the story was really good. The story, like, involves you trying to rescue your sister. But it's it's not that story that feels like the, like the, the, um, the A story. Uh, that 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 all really feels like the B story. The A story feels like everything you're learning about the Mountain King and the history of this place and the bramble that's constantly uh, around trying to stop you from progressing, as well as just like learning the lore from like just these small characters, small NPCs that you'll find uh, at some points, and then always are trying to like scare you or do these terrible acts and stuff like that. Um, do not play this game if you're a fan of heart. Uh, there are some concepts that some people, especially if they have like a small emotional threshold, you probably don't want to play this game. But as far as like a horror game, uh, especially with how short it is, this one's up there with me with uh, like Outlast in enjoyability. As well as I just love my platformers, so puzzle platformers are always fun. I think I, I'll give the game a 9 out of 10. I would really like more from uh, this game. Well, I mean, the story wrapped itself, so you can't really add any more to it. Maybe a just another game dealing with the, like, dealing with, like, a different, like, a different folklore, like, maybe... Ooh, I could get behind a Chinese one. That would be really cool. Like, have a Chinese folklore uh, version of this would be uh, would be pretty awesome. All right, so now that I've gone over both of the games, I probably shouldn't keep you here for very much longer. Sorry, it's a short podcast. Sorry, we haven't put out anything in a while. It's just we were not ready for how big Starfield and how big. Baldur's Gate 3 was, but we will be talking about Baldur's Gate 3 next time. Who knows, we might have a couple more people on to talk about it because we have a, almost all of our friends are playing this game right now. Uh, it hasn't even come out for Xbox yet, but uh, I know a bunch of my Xbox friends are probably going to get on and play it as well. So Baldur's Gate 3 is definitely a contender for Game of the Year. Um, so we'll have to see how it goes. Until next time... You had no Walker, you had no Brady, but you had me, Trent, this time. Uh, Thanks for tolerating a solo podcast, and y'all have a great day. Have a fantastic evening. Keep on playing. See you on the next Wavelength. Bye.